The Rivals of Sherlock Holmes, Volume 1 The Duchess of Wiltshire's Diamonds by Guy Boothby Part 1 To the reflective mind, the rapidity with which the inhabitants of the world's greatest city seize upon a new name or idea and familiarise themselves with it can scarcely prove otherwise than astonishing. As an illustration of my meaning, let me take the case of Klimo, the now famous private detective, who has won for himself the right to be considered as great as Lecoq, or even the late lamented Sherlock Holmes. Up to a certain morning, London had never even heard his name, nor had it the remotest notion as to who or what he might be. It was as sublimely ignorant and careless on the subject as the inhabitants of Kamchatka or Peru. Within twenty-four hours, however, the whole aspect of the case was changed. The man, woman, or child who had not seen his posters or heard his name was counted an ignoramus unworthy of intercourse with human beings. Princes became familiar with it as their trains tore them to Windsor to luncheon with the Queen. The nobility noticed and commented upon it as they drove about the town. Merchants and businessmen generally read it as they made their ways by omnibus or underground to their various shops and counting-houses. Street boys called each other by it as a nickname. Music-hall artists introduced it into their patter, while it was even rumoured that the stock exchange itself had paused in the full flood tide of business to manufacture a riddle on the subject. That Klimo made his profession pay him well was certain. First, from the fact that his advertisements must have cost a good round sum, and second, because he had taken a mansion in Belverton Street, Park Lane, next door to Porchester House, where, to the dismay of that aristocratic neighbourhood, he advertised that he was prepared to receive and be consulted by his clients. The invitation was responded to with alacrity. And from that day forward, between the hours of twelve and two, the pavement upon the north side of the street was lined with carriages, every one containing some person desirous of testing the great man's skill. I must here explain that I have narrated all this in order to show the state of affairs existing in Belverton Street and Park Lane when Simon Khan arrived, or was supposed to arrive, in England. If my memory serves me correctly, it was on Wednesday, the 3rd of May, that the Earl of Amberley drove to Victoria to meet and welcome the man whose acquaintance he had made in India under such peculiar circumstances, and under the spell of whose fascination he and his family had fallen so completely. Reaching the station, his lordship descended from his carriage and made his way to the platform set apart for the reception of the Continental Express. He walked with a jaunty air, and seemed to be on the best of terms with himself and the world in general. How little he suspected the existence of the noose into which he was so innocently running his head. As if out of compliment to his arrival, the train put in an appearance within a few moments of his reaching the platform. He immediately placed himself in such a position that he could make sure of seeing the man he wanted, and waited patiently until he should come in sight. Khan, however, was not among the first batch. Indeed, the majority of passengers had passed before his lordship caught sight of him. One thing was very certain. However great the crush might have been, it would have been difficult to mistake Khan's figure. The man's infirmity and the peculiar beauty of his face rendered him easily recognisable. Possibly after his long sojourn in India he found the morning cold, for he wore a long fur coat, the collar of which he turned up round his ears, thus making a fitting frame for his delicate face. On seeing Lord Amberley, he hastened forward to greet him. "'This is most kind and friendly of you,' he said as he shook the other by the hand. "'A fine day, and Lord Amberley to meet me. One could scarcely imagine a better welcome.' As he spoke, one of his Indian servants approached and salaamed before him. He gave him an order, and received an answer in Hindustani, whereupon he turned again to Lord Amberley. "'You may imagine how anxious I am to see my new dwelling,' he said. "'My servant tells me that my carriage is here, so may I hope that you will drive back with me and see for yourself how I am likely to be lodged?' "'I shall be delighted,' said Lord Amberley, who was longing for the opportunity." and they accordingly went out into the station-yard together to discover a broom drawn by two magnificent horses, and with Nur Ali in all the glory of white raiment and crested turban on the box waiting to receive them. 
His lordship dismissed his Victoria, and when Joa Singh had taken his place beside his fellow-servant upon the box, the carriage rolled out of the station-yard in the direction of Hyde Park. "'I trust her ladyship is quite well,' said Simon Khan, politely, as they turned into Gloucester Place. "'Excellently well, thank you,' replied his lordship. "'She bade me welcome you to England in her name as well as my own, "'and I was to say that she's looking forward to seeing you. "'She's most kind, and I shall do myself the honour of calling upon her "'as soon as circumstances will permit,' answered Khan. "'I beg you will convey my best thanks to her for her thought of me.' "'While these polite speeches were passing between them, "'they were rapidly approaching a large hoarding.' on which was displayed a poster setting forth the name of the now famous detective, Climo. Simon Kahn, leaning forward, studied it, and when they had passed, turned to his friend again. At Victoria, and on all the hoardings we meet, I see an enormous placard bearing the word Climo. Pray, what does it mean? His lordship laughed. <laughs> You're asking a question which a month ago was on the lips of nine out of every ten Londoners. It is only within the last fortnight that we have learned who and what Climo is. And pray, what is he? Well, the explanation is very simple. He's neither more nor less than a remarkably astute private detective, who has succeeded in attracting notice in such a way that half London has been induced to patronise him. I have had no dealings with the man myself, but a friend of mine, Lord Orpington, has been the victim of a most audacious burglary, and, the police having failed to solve the mystery, he has called Climo in. We shall therefore see what he can do before many days are passed. But there I expect you will soon know more about him than any of us. Indeed, and why? For the simple reason that he has taken number one, Belverton Terrace, the house adjoining your own, and sees his clients there. Simon Khan pursed up his lips, and appeared to be considering something. "'I trust you will not prove a nuisance,' he said at last. "'The agents who found me the house should have acquainted me with the fact. "'Private detectives, on however large a scale, scarcely strike one as the most desirable of neighbours, "'particularly for a man who is so fond of quiet as myself.' "'At this moment they were approaching their destination. "'As the carriage passed Belverton Street and pulled up, Lord Amberley pointed to a long line of vehicles standing before the detective's door. "'You can see for yourself something of the business he does,' he said. "'Those are the carriages of his clients, and it is probable that twice as many have arrived on foot.' "'I shall certainly speak to the agent on the subject,' said Khan, with a shadow of annoyance upon his face. "'I consider the fact of this man's being so close to me a serious drawback to the house.' Joa Singh here descended from the box and opened the door, in order that his master and his guest might alight, while portly Ram Gafur, the butler, came down the steps and salaamed before them with oriental obsequiousness. Khan greeted his domestics with kindly condescension, and then, accompanied by the ex-viceroy, entered his new abode. "'I think you may congratulate yourself upon having secured one of the most desirable residents in London.' said his lordship ten minutes or so later, when they had explored the principal rooms. "'I'm very glad to hear you say so,' said Khan. "'I trust your lordship will remember that you will always be welcome in the house as long as I am its owner.' "'That's very kind of you to say so,' returned Lord Amberley warmly. "'I shall look forward to some months of pleasant intercourse. "'And now I must be going. "'Tomorrow, perhaps, if you have nothing better to do, "'you will give us the pleasure of your company at dinner?' Your fame has already gone abroad, and yeah, we shall ask one or two nice people to meet you, including my brother and sister-in-law, Lord and Lady Gulpington, Lord and Lady Orpington, and my cousin, the Duchess of Wiltshire, whose interest in China and Indian art, as perhaps you know, is only second to your own. I shall be most glad to come. We may count on seeing you in Eaton Square, then, at eight o'clock. If I am alive, you may be sure I shall be there. Must you really go? Then good-bye, and many thanks for meeting me. His lordship having left the house, Simon Khan went upstairs to his dressing-room, which it was to be noticed he found without inquiry, and rang the electric bell beside the fireplace three times. While he was waiting for it to be answered, he stood looking out of the window at the long line of carriages in the street below. Everything is progressing admirably, he said to himself. Amberley does not suspect any more than the world in general. As a proof, he asks me to dinner tomorrow evening to meet his brother and sister-in-law, two of his particular friends, and, above all, her Grace of Wiltshire. Of course I shall go, 
and when I bid her grace good-bye, it will be strange if I am not one step nearer the interest on Lizzie's money. At this moment the door opened, and his valet, the grave and respectable Belton, entered the room. Khan turned to greet him impatiently. "'Come, come, Belton,' he said. "'We must be quick. It is twenty minutes to twelve, and if we don't hurry, the folk next door will become impatient. Have you succeeded in doing what I spoke to you about last night?' "'I have done everything, sir.' "'I'm glad to hear it. Now, uh, lock that door and let us get to work. "'You can let me have your news while I am dressing.' Opening one side of a massive wardrobe that completely filled one end of the room, Belton took from it a number of garments. They included a well-worn velvet coat, a baggy pair of trousers so old that only a notorious pauper or a millionaire could have afforded to wear them, a flannel waistcoat, a Gladstone collar, a soft silk tie, and a pair of embroidered carpet slippers upon which no old clothes man in the most reckless way of business in Petticoat Lane would have advanced a single halfpenny. Into these he assisted his master to change. "'Now give me the wig, and unfasten the straps of this hump,' said Khan, as the other placed the garments just referred to upon a neighbouring chair. Belton did as he was ordered. And then there happened a thing the like of which no one would have believed. Having unbuckled a strap on either shoulder, and slipped his hand beneath the waistcoat, he withdrew a large papier-mâché hump, which he carried away and carefully placed in a drawer of the bureau. Relieved of his burden, Simon Carne stood up as straight and well-made a man as any in Her Majesty's dominions. The malformation, for which so many, including the Earl and Countess of Amberley, had often pitied him, was nothing but a hoax intended to produce an effect which would permit him additional facilities of disguise. The hump discarded, and the grey wig fitted carefully to his head in such a manner that not even a pinch of his own curly locks could be seen beneath it, he adorned his cheeks with a pair of crepu hair whiskers, donned the flannel vest and the velvet coat previously mentioned, slipped his feet into the carpet slippers, placed a pair of smoked glasses upon his nose, and declared himself ready to proceed about his business. The man who would have known him for Simon Carne would have been as astute as, well, shall we say, as the private detective Climo himself. "'It's on the stroke of twelve, he said, as he gave a final glance at himself in the pier-glass above the dressing-table, and arranged his tie to his satisfaction. "'Should anyone call, instruct Ram Gaffur to tell them that I have gone out on business and shall not be back until three o'clock?' "'Very good, sir. Now, undo the door, and let me go in.' Thus commanded, Belton went across to the large wardrobe, which, as I have already said, covered the whole of one side of the room, and opened the middle door. Two or three garments were seen inside suspended on pegs, and these he removed, at the same time pushing towards the right panel at the rear. When this was done, a large aperture in the wall between the two houses was disclosed. Through this door Khan passed, drawing it behind him. In number one, Belverton Terrace, the house occupied by the detective, whose presence in the street Khan seemed to find so objectionable, the entrance thus constructed was covered by the peculiar kind of confessional box in which Climo invariably sat to receive his clients, the rearmost panels of which opened in the same fashion as those in the wardrobe in the dressing-room. These being pulled aside, he had but to draw them to again after him, take his seat, ring the electric bell to inform his housekeeper that he was ready, and then welcome his clients as quickly as they cared to come. Punctually at two o'clock the interviews ceased, and Climo, having reaped an excellent harvest of fees, returned to Porchester House to become Simon Khan once more. Possibly it was due to the fact that the Earl and Countess of Amberley were brimming over with his praise, it may have been the rumour that he was worth as many millions as you have fingers upon your hand that did it. One thing, however, was self-evident. Within twenty-four hours of the noble earls meeting him at Victoria Station, Simon Khan was the talk, not only of fashionable, but also of unfashionable London. That his household were, with one exception, natives of India, that he paid a rental for Porchester House which ran into five figures, that he was the greatest living authority upon China and Indian art generally, and that he had come over to England in search of a wife, were among the smallest of the canards set afloat concerning him. During dinner next evening, Khan put forth every effort to please. 
he was placed on the right hand of his hostess and next to the duchess of wiltshire to the latter he paid particular attention and to such good purpose that when the ladies returned to the drawing-room afterwards her grace was full of his praises they had discussed china of all sorts Khan had promised her a specimen which she had longed for all her life but had never been able to obtain and in return she had promised to show him the quaintly carved indian casket in which the famous necklace of which he had of course heard spent most of its time she would be wearing the jewels in question at her own ball in a week's time she informed him and if he would care to see the case when it came from her bankers on that day she would be only too pleased to show it to him as simon khan drove home in his luxurious brougham afterwards he smiled to himself as he thought of the success which was attending his first endeavour two of the guests who were stewards of the jockey club had heard with delight his idea of purchasing a horse in order to have an interest in the derby while another on hearing that he desired to become the possessor of a yacht had offered to propose him for the r c y c to crown it all however and much better than all the duchess of wiltshire had promised to show him her famous diamonds by this time next week he said to himself lizzie's interest should be considerably closer but satisfactory as my progress has been hitherto it is difficult to see how i am to get possession of the stones from what i have been able to discover they are only brought from the bank on the day the duchess intends to wear them and they are taken back by his grace the following morning while she has got them on her person it would be manifestly impossible to get them from her and as when she takes them off they are returned to their box and placed in a safe constructed in the wall of the bedroom adjoining and which for the occasion is occupied by the butler and one of the under footmen the only key being in possession of the duke himself it would be equally foolish to hope to appropriate them in what manner therefore i am to become their possessor passes my comprehension however one thing is certain obtained they must be and the attempt must be made on the night of the ball if possible in the meantime i'll set my wits to work upon a plan next day simon khan was the recipient of an invitation to the ball in question and two days later he called upon the duchess of wiltshire at her residence in belgrave square with a plan prepared he also took with him the small vase he had promised her four nights before she received him most graciously and their talk fell at once into the usual channel having examined her collection and charmed her by means of one or two judicious criticisms he asked permission to include photographs of certain of her treasures in his forthcoming book then little by little he skilfully guided the conversation on to the subject of jewels since we are discussing gems mr khan she said perhaps it would interest you to see my famous necklace by good fortune i have it in the house now for the reason that an alteration is being made to one of the clasps by my jewellers i should like to see it immensely answered khan at one time and another i have had the good fortune to examine the jewels of the leading indian princes and i should like to be able to say that i had seen the famous wiltshire necklace then you shall certainly have that honour she answered with a smile if you will ring that bell i will send for it khan rang the bell as requested and when the butler entered he was given the key of the safe and ordered to bring the case to the drawing-room oh, we must not keep it very long she observed while the man was absent it is to be returned to the bank in an hour's time i am indeed fortunate khan replied and turned to the description of some curious indian wood carving on which he was making a special feature in his book as he explained he had collected his illustrations from the doors of indian temples from the gateways of palaces from old brass work and even from carved chairs and boxes he had picked up in all sorts of odd corners her grace was most interested how strange that you should have mentioned it she said if carved boxes have any interest for you it is possible my jewel case itself may be of use to you as i think i told you during lady amberley's dinner it came from benares and has carved upon it the portraits of nearly every god in the hindu pantheon you raise my curiosity to fever heat said khan a few moments later the servant returned bringing with him a wooden box about sixteen inches long by twelve wide and eight deep which he placed upon a table beside his mistress after which he retired this is the case to which i have just been referring said the duchess placing her hand on the article in question if you glance at it you will see how exquisitely it is carved 
Concealing his eagerness with an effort, Simon Khan drew his chair up to the table and examined the box. It was with justice she had described it as a work of art. What the wood was, of which it was constructed, Khan was unable to tell. It was dark and heavy, and though it was not teak, closely resembled it. It was literally covered with quaint carving, and of its kind was a unique work of art. It is most curious and beautiful, said Khan, when he had finished his examination. In all my experience, I can safely say I have never seen its equal. If you will permit me, I should very much like to include a description and an illustration of it in my book. Of course you may do so. I shall be only too delighted, answered Her Grace. If it will help you in your work, I shall be glad to lend it to you for a few hours, in order that you may have the illustration made. This was exactly what Khan had been waiting for, and he accepted the offer with alacrity. Very well, then, she said. On the day of my ball, when it will be brought from the bank again, I will take the necklace out and send the case to you. I must make one proviso, however, and that is that you let me have it back the same day. I will certainly promise to do that, replied Khan. And now let us look inside, said his hostess. Choosing a key from a bunch she carried in her pocket, she unlocked the casket and lifted the lid. Accustomed as Khan had all his life been to the sight of gems, what he saw before him then almost took his breath away. The inside of the box, both sides and bottom, was quilted with the softest Russia leather, and on this luxurious couch reposed the famous necklace. The fire of the stones, when the light caught them, was sufficient to dazzle the eyes. So fierce was it. As Khan could see, every gem was perfect of its kind, and there were no fewer than three hundred of them. The setting was a fine example of the jeweller's art. And last but not least, the value of the whole affair was fifty thousand pounds, a mere flea bite to the man who had given it to his wife, but a fortune to any humbler person. "'And now that you have seen my property, what do you think of it?' asked the Duchess, as she watched her visitor's face. "'It is very beautiful,' he answered, "'and I do not wonder that you are proud of it. "'Yes, the diamonds are very fine. "'But I think it is their abiding place that fascinates me more. "'Have you any objection to my measuring it?' "'Pray do so, if it is likely to be of any assistance to you,' replied Her Grace." Khan thereupon produced a small ivory rule, ran it over the box, and the figures he thus obtained he jotted down in his pocket-book. Ten minutes later, when the case had been returned to the safe, he thanked the Duchess for her kindness and took his departure, promising to call in person for the empty case on the morning of the ball. Reaching home, he passed into his study, and seating himself at his writing-table, pulled a sheet of note-paper towards him, and began to sketch, as well as he could remember it, the box he had seen. Then he leant back in his chair and closed his eyes. "'I've cracked a good many hard nuts in my time,' he said reflectively, "'but never one that seemed so difficult at first sight as this. "'As far as I see at present, the case stands as follows. "'The box will be brought from the bank, where it usually reposes, "'to Wiltshire House on the morning of the dance. "'I shall be allowed to have possession of it, without the stones, of course, "'for a period possibly extending from eleven o'clock in the morning to four or five, "'at any rate not later than seven in the evening.' After the ball, the necklace will be returned to it, when it will be locked up in the safe, over which the butler and a footman will mount guard. To get into the room during the night is not only too risky, but physically out of the question, while to rob Her Grace of her treasure during the progress of the dance would be equally impossible. The Duke fetches the casket and takes it back to the bank himself. So, to all intents and purposes, I'm almost as far off the solution as ever. Half an hour went by and found him still seated at his desk, staring at the drawing on the paper. Then an hour. The traffic of the streets rolled past the house unheeded. Finally, Joa Singh announced his carriage, and, feeling that an idea might come to him with a change of scene, he set off for a drive in the park. By this time, his elegant mail phaeton, with its magnificent horses and Indian servant on the seat behind, was as well known as Her Majesty's state equipage, and attracted almost as much attention. Today, however, the fashionable world noticed that Simon Khan looked preoccupied. He was still working out his problem, but so far without much success. 
Suddenly something, no one will ever be able to say what, put an idea into his head. The notion was no sooner born in his brain than he left the park and drove home quickly. Ten minutes had scarcely elapsed before he was back in his study again, and had ordered that Wajib Baksh should be sent to him. When the man he wanted put in an appearance, Khan handed him the paper upon which he had made the drawing of the jewel case. "'Look at this,' he said, "'and tell me what thou seest there.' "'I see a box,' answered the man, who by this time was well accustomed to his master's ways. "'As thou sayest, it is a box,' said Khan. "'The wood is heavy and thick, though what wood it is I do not know. "'The measurements are upon the paper below. "'Within, both the sides and bottom are quilted with soft leather, "'as I have also shown. I think now, Wajib Baksh, "'for in this case thou wilt need to have all thy wits about thee. "'Tell me, is it in thy power, O most cunning of all craftsmen, "'to insert such extra sides within this box "'that they, being held by a spring, "'shall lie so snug as not to be noticeable to the ordinary eye? "'Can it be so arranged that when the box is locked "'they shall fall flat upon the bottom, "'thus covering and holding fast what lies beneath them, "'and yet making the box appear to the eye as if it were empty? "'Is it possible for thee to do such a thing?' Wajib Baksh did not reply for a few moments. His instinct told him what his master wanted, and he was not disposed to answer hastily, for he also saw that his reputation as the most cunning craftsman in India was at stake. "'If the heaven-born will permit me the night for thought,' he said at last, "'I will come to him when he rises from his bed and tell him what I can do, and he can then give his orders as it pleases him.' "'Very good,' said Khan. Then tomorrow morning I shall expect thy report. Let the work be good, and there will be many rupees for thee to touch in return. As to the lock and the way it shall act, let that be the concern of Hiram Singh. Wajib Baksh salaamed and withdrew, and Simon Khan, for the time being, dismissed the matter from his mind. Next morning, while he was dressing, Belton reported that the two artificers desired an interview with him. He ordered them to be admitted, and forthwith they entered the room. It was noticeable that Wajib Baksh carried in his hand a heavy box, which, upon Khan's motioning him to do so, he placed upon the table. "'Have ye thought over the matter?' he asked, seeing that the men waited for him to speak. "'We have thought of it,' replied Hiram Singh, who always acted as spokesman for the pair. "'If the presence will deign to look, he will see—' that we have made a box of the size and shape such as he drew upon the paper. Yes, it is certainly a good copy, said Khan condescendingly, after he'd examined it. Wajib Bak showed his white teeth in appreciation of the compliment, and Hiram Singh drew closer to the table. And now, if the Saib will open it, he will in his wisdom be able to tell if it resembles the other that he has in his mind. Khan opened the box as requested and discovered that the interior was an exact counterfeit of the Duchess of Wiltshire's jewel case, even to the extent of the quilted leather lining which had been the other's principal feature. He admitted that the likeness was all that could be desired. "'As he is satisfied,' said Hiram Singh, "'it may be that the protector of the poor will deign to try an experiment with it. See, here is a comb. Let it be placed in the box. So.' Now he will see what he will see. The broad, silver-backed comb lying upon his dressing-table was placed on the bottom of the box. The lid was closed and the key turned in the box. The case being securely fastened, Hiram Singh laid it before his master. I am to open it, I suppose, said Khan, taking the key and replacing it in the lock. If my master pleases, replied the other. Khan accordingly turned it in the lock and having done so, raised the lid and looked inside. His astonishment was complete. To all intents and purposes, the box was empty. The comb was not to be seen, and yet the quilted sides and bottom were, to all appearances, just the same as when he had first looked inside. "'This is most wonderful,' he said. And, indeed, it was as clever a conjuring trick as any he had ever seen. "'Nay, it is very simple,' Wajib Baksh replied. The heaven-born told me that there must be no risk of detection. He took the box in his own hands, and running his nails down the centre of the quilting, dividing the false bottom into two pieces. These he lifted out, 
revealing the comb lying on the real bottom beneath. The sides, as my lord will see, said Hiram Singh, taking a step forward, are held in their appointed places by these two springs. Thus, when the key is turned, the springs relax, and the sides are driven by others into their places on the bottom, where the seams in the quilting mask the join. But there is one disadvantage. It is as follows. When the pieces which form the bottom are lifted out, in order that my lord may get at whatever lies concealed beneath, the springs must of necessity stand revealed. However, to anyone who knows sufficient of the working of the box to lift out the false bottom, it will be an easy matter to withdraw the springs and conceal them about his person. As you say, that is an easy matter, said Khan, and I shall not be likely to forget. Now, one other question. Presuming I'm in a position to put the real box into your hands for, say, eight hours, do you think that in that time you can fit it up so that detection will be impossible? Assuredly, my lord replied Hiram Singh with conviction. There is but the lock and the fitting of the springs to be done. Three hours at most would suffice for that. I am pleased with you, said Khan. As a proof of my satisfaction, when the work is finished, you will each receive five hundred rupees. Now you can go. According to his promise, ten o'clock on the Friday following found him in his hansom driving towards Belgrave Square. He was a little anxious, though the casual observer would scarcely have been able to tell it. The magnitude of the stake for which he was playing was enough to try the nerve of even such a past master in his profession as Simon Khan. Arriving at the house, he discovered some workmen erecting an awning across the footway in preparation for the ball that was to take place at night. It was not long, however, before he found himself in the boudoir, reminding Her Grace of her promise to permit him an opportunity of making a drawing of the famous jewel case. The Duchess was naturally busy, and within a quarter of an hour he was on his way home with the box placed on the seat of the carriage beside him. Now, he said as he patted it good-humouredly, if only the notion worked out by Hiram Singh and Wajib Baksh holds good, the famous Wiltshire diamonds will become my property before very many hours are past. By this time tomorrow, I suppose, London will be all agog concerning the burglary. On reaching his house, he left his carriage and himself carried the box into his study. Once there, he rang his bell and ordered Hiram Singh and Wajib Baksh to be sent to him. When they arrived, he showed them the box upon which they were to exercise their ingenuity. Bring your tools in here, he said, and do the work under my own eyes. You have but nine hours before you, so you must make the most of them. The men went for their implements, and as soon as they were ready, set to work. All through the day they were kept hard at it, with the result that by five o'clock the alterations had been effected and the case stood ready. By the time Khan returned from his afternoon drive in the park, it was quite prepared for the part it was to play in his scheme. Having praised the men, he turned them out and locked the door, then went across the room and unlocked a drawer in his writing table. From it he took a flat leather jewel case which he opened. It contained a necklace of counterfeit diamonds, if anything a little larger than the one he intended to try to obtain. He had purchased it that morning in the Burlington Arcade for the purpose of testing the apparatus his servants had made, and this he now proceeded to do. Laying it carefully upon the bottom, he closed the lid and turned the key. When he opened it again, the necklace was gone, and even though he knew the secret, he could not, for the life of him, see where the false bottom began and ended. After that, he reset the trap and tossed the necklace carelessly in. To his delight, it acted as well as on the previous occasion. He could scarcely contain his satisfaction. His conscience was sufficiently elastic to give him no trouble. To him, it was scarcely a robbery he was planning but an artistic trial of skill, in which he pitted his wits and cunning against the forces of society in general. That is the end of The Duchess of Wiltshire's Diamonds by Guy Boothby, Part 1. Re the Rivals of Sherlock Holmes, Volume 1. The Duchess of Wiltshire's Diamonds by Guy Boothby, Part 2. At half-past seven he dined and afterwards smoked a meditative cigar over the evening paper in the billiard-room. The invitations to the ball were for ten o'clock, and at nine-thirty he went to his dressing-room. "'Make me tidy as quickly as you can,' he said to Belton when the latter appeared. 
and while you're doing so, listen to my final instructions. Tonight, as you know, I am endeavouring to secure the Duchess of Wiltshire's necklace. Tomorrow morning all London will resound with the hubbub, and I have been making my plans in such a way as to arrange that Clemo shall be the first person consulted. When the messenger calls, if call he does, see that the old woman next door bids him tell the Duke to come personally at twelve o'clock. Do you understand? Perfectly, sir. Very good. Now give me the jewel case and let me be on. You need not sit up for me. Precisely as the clocks in the neighbourhood were striking ten, Simon Khan reached Belgrave Square, and, as he hoped, found himself the first guest. His hostess and her husband received him in the anteroom of the drawing-room. "'I come laden with a thousand apologies,' he said, as he took her grace's hand and bent over it with that ceremonious politeness which was one of the man's chief characteristics. "'I am most unconscionably early, I know, but I hastened here in order that I might personally return the jewel-case you so kindly lent me. I must trust your generosity to forgive me. The drawings took longer than I expected.' "'Please do not apologise," answered her grace. "'It is very kind of you to have brought the case yourself.' I hope the illustrations have proved successful. I shall look forward to seeing them as soon as they are ready. But I am keeping you holding the box. One of my servants will take it to my room. She called a footman to her and bade him take the box and place it upon her dressing table. Before it goes, I must let you see that I have not damaged it, either externally or internally, said Khan with a laugh. It is such a valuable case that I should never forgive myself if it had even received a scratch during the time it has been in my possession. So saying, he lifted the lid, and allowed her to look inside. To all appearance it was exactly the same as when she had lent it to him earlier in the day. "'You have been most careful,' she said. And then, with an air of banter, she continued, "'If you desire it, I shall be pleased to give you a certificate to that effect.' They jested in this fashion for a few moments after the servant's departure, during which time Khan promised to call upon her the following morning at eleven o'clock, and to bring with him the illustrations he had made, and a queer little piece of china he had had the good fortune to pick up in a dealer's shop the previous afternoon. By this time fashionable London was making its way up the grand staircase, and with its appearance further conversation became impossible. Shortly after midnight Khan bade his hostess good night and slipped away. He was perfectly satisfied with his evening's entertainment and if the key of the jewel-case were not turned before the jewels were placed in it, he was convinced they would become his property. It speaks well for his strength of nerve when I record the fact that on going to bed his slumbers were as peaceful and untroubled as those of a little child. Breakfast was scarcely over next morning before a hansom drew up to his front door and Lord Amberley alighted. He was ushered into Khan's presence forthwith, and on seeing that the latter was surprised at his early visit, hastened to explain. "'My dear fellow,' he said, as he took possession of the chair the other offered him, "'I've come round to see you on most important business. As I told you last night at the dance, when you so kindly asked me to come and see the steam yacht you had purchased, I had an appointment with Wiltshire at half-past nine this morning.' On reaching Belgrave Square I found the whole house in confusion. Servants were running hither and thither with scared faces. The butler was on the borders of lunacy. The Duchess was well-nigh hysterical in her boudoir, while her husband was in his study vowing vengeance against all the world. "'You alarm me,' said Khan, lighting a cigarette with a hand that was as steady as a rock. "'What on earth has happened?' "'I uh, think I might safely allow you fifty guesses and then wager a hundred pounds you'd not hit the mark, and yet in a certain measure it concerns you.' "'Concerns me? Good gracious, what have I done to bring all this about?' "'Pray do not look so alarmed,' said Amberley. "'Personally, you have done nothing. "'Indeed, on second thoughts, I don't know that I am right in saying that it concerns you at all. "'The fact of the matter is, Khan, a burglary took place last night at Wiltshire House, "'and the famous necklace has disappeared.' "'Good heavens, you don't say so.' "'But I do. The circumstances of the case are as follows.' When my cousin retired to her room last night after the ball, she unclasped the necklace, and in her husband's presence placed it carefully in her jewel-case, which she locked. That having been done, Wiltshire took the box to the room which contained the safe, and himself placed it there, locking the iron door with his own key. The room was occupied that night, according to custom, by the butler and one of the footmen, both of whom have been in the family since they were boys. 
Next morning, after breakfast, the Duke unlocked the safe and took out the box, intending to convey it to the bank as usual. Before leaving, however, he placed it on his study table and went upstairs to speak to his wife. He cannot remember exactly how long he was absent, but he feels convinced that he was not gone more than a quarter of an hour, at the very utmost. Their conversation finished, she accompanied him downstairs, where she saw him take up the case to carry it to his carriage. Before he left the house, however, she said, I suppose you have looked to see that the necklace is all right. How could I do so, was his reply. You know you possess the only key that will fit it. She felt in her pockets, but to her surprise the key was not there. If I were a detective, I should say that is a point to be remembered, said Khan with a smile. Pray, where did she find her keys? Upon her dressing table, said Amberley, though she has not the slightest recollection of leaving them there. Well, when she'd procured the keys, what happened? Why, they opened the box, and to their astonishment and dismay, found it empty. The jewels were gone. Good gracious. What a terrible loss. It seems almost impossible that it can be true. And pray, what did they do? At first they stood staring into the empty box, hardly believing the evidence of their own eyes. Stare how they would, however, they could not bring them back. The jewels had, without doubt, disappeared. But when and where the robbery had taken place, it was impossible to say. After that they had up all the servants and questioned them. But the result was, as they might have foreseen, no one from the butler to the kitchen maid could throw any light upon the subject. To this minute it remains as great a mystery as when they first discovered it. I am more concerned than I can tell you, said Khan. How thankful I ought to be that I returned the case to Her Grace last night, but in thinking of myself I am forgetting to ask what has brought you to me. If I can be of any assistance, I hope you will command me. Well, I'll tell you why I have come, replied Lord Amberley. Naturally, they are most anxious to have the mystery solved and the jewels recovered as soon as possible. Now, Wiltshire wanted to send to Scotland Yard there and then, but his wife and I eventually persuaded him to consult Klima. As you know, if the police authorities are called in first, he refuses the business altogether. Now, we thought you are his next-door neighbour. You might possibly be able to assist us. You may be very sure, my lord, I will do everything that lies in my power. Let us go in and see him at once. As he spoke, he rose and threw what remained of his cigarette into the fireplace. His visitor, having imitated his example, they procured their hats and walked round from Park Lane into Belverton Street to bring up at number one. After they had rung the bell, the door was opened to them by the old woman, who invariably received the detective's clients. "'Is Mr. Klimo at home?' asked Khan. "'And if so, can we see him?' The old lady was a little deaf, and the question had to be repeated before she could be made to understand what was wanted. As soon, however, as she realised their desire, she informed them that her master was absent from town, but would be back, as usual, at twelve o'clock to meet his clients. "'What on earth's to be done?' said the earl, looking at his companion in dismay. I'm afraid I can't come back again, as I have a most important appointment at that hour. Do you think you could entrust the business to me? asked Khan. If so, I will make a point of seeing him at twelve o'clock, and could call at Wiltshire House afterwards and tell the Duke what I have done. That's very good of you, replied Amberley. If you are sure it would not put you to too much trouble, that would be quite the best thing to be done. I will do it with pleasure, Khan replied. I feel it my duty to help in whatever way I can. Oh, you're very kind, said the other. Then, as I understand it, you are to call upon Klimo at twelve o'clock, and afterwards to let my cousins know what you have succeeded in doing. I only hope he will help us to secure the thief. We're having too many of these burglaries just now. I must catch this handsome and be off. Goodbye, and many thanks. Goodbye, said Khan, and shook him by the hand. The handsome, having rolled away, Khan retraced his steps to his own abode. "'Tis really very strange,' he muttered as he walked along. "'How often chance condescends to lend her assistance to my little schemes.' The mere fact that His Grace left the box unwatched in his study for a quarter of an hour may serve to throw the police off on quite another scent. I'm also glad that they decided to open the case in the house, for if it had gone to the bankers and had been placed in the strong room unexamined, I should never have been able to get possession of the jewels at all. Three hours later he drove to Wiltshire House and saw the Duke. The Duchess was far too much upset by the catastrophe to see anyone. This is really most kind of you, Mr. Khan, 
said his grace when the other had supplied an elaborate account of his interview with Klimo. we are extremely indebted to you i am sorry he cannot come before ten o'clock to-night and that makes this uh, stipulation of my seeing him alone for i must confess i would like to have had someone else present to ask any questions that might escape me but if that's his usual hour and custom well we must abide by it that's all i hope he will do some good for this is the greatest calamity that has ever befallen me as i told you just now it has made my wife quite ill she's confined to her bedroom and quite hysterical you do not suspect anyone, I suppose, inquired Khan. No, not a soul, the other answered. The thing is such a mystery that we do not know what to think. I, I feel convinced, however, that my servants are as innocent as I am. Nothing will ever make me think them otherwise. I wish I could catch the fellow, that's all. I'd make him suffer for the trick he's played me. Khan offered an appropriate reply, and after a little further conversation upon the subject, bade the irate nobleman goodbye and left the house. From Belgrave Square he drove to one of the clubs of which he had been elected a member in search of Lord Orpington, with whom he had promised a lunch, and afterwards took him to a shipbuilder's yard near Greenwich in order to show him the steam yacht he had lately purchased. It was close upon dinner time before he returned to his own residence. He brought Lord Orpington with him, and they dined in state together. At nine the latter bade him good-bye, and at ten Khan retired to his dressing-room and rang for Belton. "'What have you to report?' he asked, "'with regard to what I bade you do in Belgrave Square.' "'I followed your instructions to the letter,' Belton replied. "'Yesterday morning I wrote to Messrs. Horniblow and Jimson, "'the house agents in Piccadilly, "'in the name of Colonel Braithwaite, "'and asked for an order to view the residence "'to the right of Wiltshire House. "'I asked that the order might be sent direct to the house "'where the Colonel would get it upon his arrival.' This letter I posted myself in Basingstoke, as you desired me to do. At nine o'clock yesterday morning I dressed myself as much like an elderly army officer as possible and took a cab to Belgrave Square. The caretaker, an old fellow of close upon seventy years of age, admitted me immediately upon hearing my name and proposed that he should show me over the house. This, however, I told him was quite unnecessary, backing my speech with a present of half a crown. Whereupon he returned to his breakfast perfectly satisfied, while I wandered about the house at my own leisure. Reaching the same floor as that upon which is situated the room in which the Duke's safe is kept, I discovered that your supposition was quite correct, that it would be possible for a man, by opening the window, to make his way along the coping from one house to the other without being seen. I made certain that there was no one in the bedroom in which the butler slept, and then arranged the long telescope walking stick you gave me, and fixed one of my boots to it by means of the screw in the end. With this I was able to make a regular succession of footsteps in the dust along the ledge between one window and the other. That done, I went downstairs again, bade the caretaker good morning, and got into my cab. From Belgrave Square I drove to the shop of the pawnbroker, whom you told me you had discovered was out of town. His assistant inquired my business and was anxious to do what he could for me. I told him, however, that I must see his master personally, as it was about the sale of some diamonds I'd had left me. I pretended to be annoyed that he was not at home and muttered to myself, so that the man could hear something about its meaning a journey to Amsterdam. And then I limped out of the shop, paid off my cab, and walking down a by-street, removed my moustache, and altered my appearance by taking off my greatcoat and muffler. A few streets further on, I purchased a bowler hat in place of the old-fashioned topper I'd hitherto been wearing, and then took a cab from Piccadilly and came home. "'You have fulfilled my instructions admirably,' said Khan. "'And if the business comes off, as I expect it will, you shall receive your usual percentage. Now I must be turned into Climo and be off to Belgrave Square to put his grace of Wiltshire upon the track of this burglar. Before he retired to rest that night, Simon Khan took something wrapped in a red silk handkerchief from the capacious pocket of the coat Climo had been wearing a few moments before. Having unrolled the covering, he held up to the light the magnificent necklace, which for so many years had been the joy and pride of the ducal house of Wiltshire. The electric light played upon it and touched it with a thousand different hues. Where so many have failed, he said to himself, as he wrapped it in the handkerchief again and locked it in his safe. 
It is pleasant to be able to congratulate oneself on having succeeded. It is without its equal, and I don't think I shall be overstepping the mark if I say that I think when she receives it, Liz will be glad she lent me the money. Next morning, all London was astonished by the news that the famous Wiltshire diamonds had been stolen. And a few hours later, Khan learned from an evening paper that the detectives who had taken up the case upon the supposed retirement from it of Klimo were still completely at fault. That evening he was to entertain several friends to dinner. They included Lord Amberley, Lord Orpington, and a prominent member of the Privy Council. Lord Amberley arrived late, but filled to overflowing with importance. His friends noticed his state and questioned him. Well, gentlemen, he answered, as he took up a commanding position upon the drawing-room hearthrug, I am in a position to inform you that Klimo has reported upon the case, and the upshot of it is that the Wiltshire Diamond mystery is a mystery no longer. What do you mean? asked the others in a chorus. I mean that he sent in his report to Wiltshire this afternoon as arranged. From what he said the other night, after being alone in the room with the empty jewel case and a magnifying glass for two minutes or so, he was in a position to describe the modus operandi and, what is more, to put the police on the scent of the burglar. And how has it worked? asked Khan. From the empty house next door, replied the other. On the morning of the burglary, a man, purporting to be a retired army officer, called with an order to view, got the caretaker out of the way, clambered along to Wiltshire House by means of the parapet outside, reached the room during the time the servants were at breakfast, opened the safe, and abstracted the jewels. "'But uh, how did Klimo find all this out?' asked Lord Orpington. "'By his own inimitable cleverness,' replied Lord Amberley. "'At any rate, it has been proved that he was correct. "'The man did make his way from next door, "'and the police have since discovered that an individual "'answering to the description given "'visited a pawnbroker's shop in the city about an hour later "'and stated that he had diamonds to sell. "'If that is so, it turns out to be a very simple mystery after all,' "'said Lord Orpington, as they began their meal. "'Thanks to the ingenuity of the cleverest detective in the world,' "'remarked Amberley. "'In that case, here's a good health to Klimo," said the Privy Councillor, raising his glass. "'I will join you in that,' said Simon Kahn. "'Here's a very good health to Klimo, and his connection with the Duchess of Wiltshire's diamonds. "'May he always be equally successful.' "'Hear, hear to that,' replied his guests. End of The Duchess of Wiltshire's Diamonds by Guy Boothby, Part 2